All right, Colin, how are you doing today? I'm good, Harry. How are you doing? Did you figure out all your AV issues? Oh, this is a perennial issue for me. Anyone that's ever worked <laughs> with me will tell you my Wi-Fi goes out, something breaks. Uh, my wife says I'm an energy taker. It just, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what well, that means, but uh, yeah. It's, you're you're it's the pretty, smart one, I'm the common. reliable one. And uh, today <laughs> we've got a great guest in uh, Kirk, who uh, I believe you know pretty well and you're friends with. And so I'm going to let you go ahead and uh, read his bio and we'll get started. Nice. Kirk, great to have you. Um, and good to see your face again. Um, well, let me uh, give you a little bit about Kirk. Um, Kirk is a you know programmer, inventor, entrepreneur, and investor. He's uh, I mean he's got a great kind of career behind him. Uh, he previously founded a computer vision company called Scan Inc. Um, that was a consumer app, raised about ten million in funding. Uh, app was downloaded like two hundred fifty million times, so just a few. Um, and he sold that to Snap, uh, where he went on to do great things there. Um, and you know, and when Snap went public, um, I think his investors did well uh, from Scan. Uh, but he was also you know really critical in the team there, doing um, going from thirty to over two thousand engineers uh, and leading engineering teams in Los Angeles, um, as well as in, in Utah as well. Um, but he, you know, their teams worked on the camera, built creativity tools, um, which hundreds of millions of Snapchat users uh, love and use every day. So. Um, we'll keep going on that, but, uh, he retired from snap uh, after five years and now is focused heavily and we'll hit, uh, I think uh, a bit on this more later on artificial intelligence, as well as another company that I know a little bit about, but, uh, I'll let Kirk tell us more. Uh, but he is a very prolific investor, um, have invested in over uh, 250, um, including silver unicorns. So I'm excited to like dig into that, uh, and understand, first of all, how do I get that deal flow myself? Um, but, uh, yeah, hear your story and, uh, what you can share with people and help them along their journey. Oh, very cool. <clears throat> yeah. So I started out, uh, investing my first investment that I made, uh, was actually during my time in my startup, uh, one of our investors in scan the company that I started, like it's coming up on 10 years ago. Uh, his name was a guy, he's a guy named Naval Ravikant. And Naval is Heard kind of, of legendary. <laughs> in, in Back when we met him, he didn't have any Twitter followers wow. uh, or anything, but we met with him and he did like a 15 minute coffee with us in San Francisco. And he said, uh, you guys fit my pattern. I'll write you a check for hundred K, but you have to list your startup on, on my website called angel list. <laughs> and, uh, and so we said, okay, we'll do that. Like, but we don't even know what angel list is. And it was, it was not really a thing at that point. Uh, but we went through and we went and registered our company and put in all our information on AngelList and then uh, Naval backed us. And then at the time, I followed Naval and requested to be part of his syndicate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've since then, over the last 10 years, followed Naval into every one of his deals uh, and have and it has just been incredible because he started the marketplace for connecting startups with capital. Yeah. And I think it has been a very elegant solution and has like every time a startup is raising through AngelList, it's just so convenient to be able to ACH money or, or get them what they need and sign documents. And so um, now on AngelList, I've got over 400 investments that I've made. Uh, I've invested in a lot of the AngelList funds as well that then um, are, are indirect investments that go out to a bunch of the different AngelList portfolio companies. And I think that it just has been a critical tool for helping connect uh, investors with startups and letting startups be able to easily raise fundraising. And so that's kind of my background on how I got into angel investing. And, Very cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's helpful. And, uh, you know, the 400, so it sounds like you made about 400 direct investments and maybe thousands more indirectly through funds and things like that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I've got I've got a few more uh, get to know you questions for our audience, and then we'll dive in because I, I really like that kind of angel list, um, and I'd love to know more about following every one of uh, Naval's deals for ten years. So I think we're gonna have to ask you about that. But uh, so so we can get to know you real quick. Uh, how many angel investments have you made this year, or do you plan to make? Oh, this year it's slowed down quite a bit, just hmm. because I feel like there have not been nearly as many deals that have come through. Um, so I've probably made, on average, I was doing between two and three investments a week last year. And okay. then this year, I've probably done about one a week. Got uh, it. So we're a few months in, so let's call that maybe, uh, there's been, what, we're three three months in, so three maybe about in. 10, 
Yeah. Yeah. 10 okay. investments. Cool. Uh, what's your average uh, check size for these investments? If I'm super bullish, I'll do 25 to hundred K. If I'm like, just want to know what's going on in that mm-hmm. space uh, mm-hmm. and get an up investor update, I'll do like mm-hmm. anywhere between 2000 and 10,000. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. Cool. So I, forgive me. I'm going to go into focus mode here. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. And what, uh, what type of startups do you look for and what stage primarily? Yeah. So my favorite is sub $30 million valuation. Mm-hmm. Um, I really love when they're uh, even lower valuations, though those are hard to come by. And the only thing that I have to believe is true is oh, there's one of two things. It's a, it's an either or. Uh, the first one is, are they making something that will be an inevitability? Mm -hmm. So when I look at it, like, and so you can, maybe we can just look at like DoorDash and Uber and, um, and like some of just the, the classic, just killer, killer investments. It's like, will there be a future where, uh, food will come to the doorstep when I want it? And like either by human or by drone, like that is the future. Mm. Um, and, uh. And like, if you think about Uber, like something that gets interesting there is <clears throat> obviously I should be able to connect with a driver and be able to get anywhere that I want to go. That's a million times better than a taxi. Yeah. But what's a million times better than that is having my car go and uh, just automatically drive around and pick people up. And that's an inevitability too. Yeah. And so you, you just kind of like look for things where it's like, that is a hundred percent going to happen. We don't know which team is going to make it happen. And, and so that's why I like spray and pray where mm-hmm. it's like, I don't need to go heavy, like in every single deal that I do and do a massive amount of diligence. I would much rather, I just view it like playing roulette. And I've, yeah. I've also I'd like my favorite quote from uh, uh, Michael Siebel, the guy who now runs Y Combinator yeah. is uh, just, uh, he, he told me one day that angel investing is just buying lottery, rich people buying lottery tickets. And I'm like, that actually, although it's like mm-hmm. a little bit derogatory, that's like, we should actually understand that that's a little bit about what's going on, which is we can't, it's, it's better than buying water tickets because we're not throwing money away, but we should understand that there's a huge probability curve with how we're approaching investing. And we should understand that the majority of our investments are going to zero out because we're trying to fund innovation and that's hard. Yeah. And so I like the idea of like, I already know that 90% of my investments are not going to return capital, uh, but I would rather get as many uh, chips on the roulette table so that if it hits green, um, have you guys ever played roulette? Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. just trying to remember what is the, what is the good one pay when you hit the, hit the single yeah, yeah. number 26 to one or 50 to yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, It's like a massive payout. And so you want as many chips on the table as possible. Yeah. And uh, in gambling, the house always wins because mm-hmm. the odds are always in their favor. But I think in angel investing, uh, I think that an angel investor who's well diversified uh, is, is also is going to win more often than the house wins yeah. because not 90% of startups fail uh, and, and zero out. It's, there's, there's, a, there's a probability curve there as well. And some of them are going to 1x and some of them will phase yeah. out into one. And then what's really cool about uh, angel investing and what I love about it is that some of the investments will 1,000, 2,000, or 10,000x. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But there's a little bit of a number, numbers game to that. And so I would rather be exposed to more opportunities with less due diligence uh, than have way more due diligence and have way more fear. Like imagine if you're dropping like a quarter million of your own money into startups, like you're, you're going to get four chips on the table. Mm -hmm. And when the ball is spinning on the roulette table, you're like your odds of having like a really successful outcome are actually quite small. And so even if you have major conviction on the team and the idea relative to your um, cash that you have to be able to deploy, I think that you should be able to deploy. If you want to angel invest, you should probably want to be able to deploy at least into a hundred deals over Mm -hmm. some period of time. And if you can't get into a hundred deals, then you don't have probability on your side. Um, So if you look at the total amount that you can invest, let's say that you have a million dollars as an angel to deploy then mm-hmm. you just chop that up into a hundred deals and then you're at 10 K a pop. And now you've got a hundred different deals across a million deployed. 
And if you get a 1000 X on, uh, on one of your $10,000 deals, now you've got, uh, now you've paid back your entire fund and made, uh, your entire initial investment and made money on top of it. Yeah. So I like that spray and pray approach. However, it does require massive deal flow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you have to be able to evaluate and vet a lot of deals. Let's say that you want to deploy a hundred into a hundred deals over the period of a couple of years, you probably need to see maybe like 500 to a thousand deals, uh, and then have some sense of like, we're not going to invest in everything that we see. Yeah. Um, well, I know Colin is uh, eager to jump in and where you and ask you where you get your deal flow. I can see him uh, licking his lips over there. But before we get to that, Colin, um, I want to ask. So, it sounds like I like the hundred deals, um, you know. And where did you come up with this investing strategy, or how did you think about it? it? How'd you how'd you yeah. learn it? How'd you refine it? Who'd you steal it from? Um, I just made it up from Michael Siebel telling me that okay. angel things lottery tickets, and then so my my uh, kind of like my. IRR calculated over the last 10 years of angel investing mm -hmm. is 50% uh, okay. IRR. And I think like the average VC is aiming for 34% or thir like 30, like 30%, 30 which is still freaking nuts. Yeah. Like 30% return on your money year over year is like, that is disgusting when compounding comes into play. Right. Well, I mean, I think you obviously have to, you know, if the S and P 500 is returning about eight to 10% on average a year, right. And you're investing into VC, right. Seven to 10 year illiquid, right. You got to be getting at least like a two, three X premium on your money. Right. So it might be tough, but it is like kind of what you need. I'm pretty sure that the only reason why my IRR is at 50% right mm -hmm. now is because of the fact that I've had the bias of us syndicating all of the balls deals. And like being able to like participate in those because his ability to detect signal from noise is massive because he has so much more data mm. and he makes so many investments that his yeah. like pattern matcher detector is finely attuned. He can meet a founder. He's seen the story play out so many times of like, this is a person with an idea and uh, you start to just get a really good sense for like, can this person and team pull it off? And, uh, and so I, in one sense, I'm like gladly writing his coattails. Mm -hmm. Like I will gladly like learn about everything that he has to teach. And like, uh, he does yearly calls. He's very inaccessible. Now he got very famous on Twitter and has over a million yeah. followers. And if you email Naval, he, you get an auto response where he says, I no longer check email. And, uh, Legit. And so, yeah, he's just like <laughs> completely just like, I'm done with the life of like being a digital worker. Yeah. And uh, you got to respect that to some degree. But uh, he talks how he talks about this concept of game theory, how angel investing is actually uh, uh, you have you have to understand that the founder is trying to uh, the founder. It's founder versus investor is mm -hmm. how Nepal approaches it, which I think is an insight that he's only learned in the last you know five years. But it's like the founder is trying to get the most money for the least amount of equity given away as possible. Right. And the investor is trying to get the most amount of equity for the least amount of money. So those two are at odds. So you have yeah. to realize that you are playing a game where someone's trying to like both sides are trying to get as much as they can. There's a way to play that game in the long term where uh, you kind of like have a win win scenario. But I think that you have to understand that anytime a founder is pitching you, they're always going to lean towards exaggerating their position. Mm -hmm. They want to they always want to exaggerate that they have uh, uh, more progress than they have, that they have more, um, that they have more talent than they have. And there's just going to be a lot of posturing. It's just, you just have to understand that there's a sales dynamic going on there um, that is naturally going to happen. And then the investor is going to do his posturing or her posturing as well saying, well, we have so many other deals and we have like access to these other things and you're a dime a dozen. And uh, so there's just this very much like competitive dynamic. And I think where, uh, where angel investing kind of hits the sweet spot is where you have sincerity on both sides mm -hmm. of like, I'm building this thing because I'm convinced on this mission and I'm passionate and I'm investing in this thing because I'm convinced on the mission and I'm passionate about making that happen. And I think when those two are in alignment, that's where you have a really great relationship between the investor and the founder. So I'll stop my rant there. You can get me going on rants and I'll just keep talking to you. <laughs> no, no wonderful. If, if you don't hear us interrupting you, you yeah. know that we like what you're saying. Don't worry. I'll have no problem interrupting you if it starts getting boring. How about that, Kirk? 
<laughs> where I've kind of landed is like, and why I, I said it, it um, kind of in the email to you guys before yeah. we did the podcast, so why I have a low bar is I actually want to do a total of maybe three minutes max of due diligence on a deal. <laughs> If I can't see instantly the problem that you're solving and your valuation and what the return on it could be, uh, and the very way that you present yourself in your deck and in your writing and in your business, that's enough information for me. If you have a very, uh, and sometimes like you don't want the deck to be too beautiful or too markety because that also means that they're trying to use design and tactics on yeah. investors who should be using that on product. Like, Let's like, don't spend so much time designing for me. Like you should be designing for your end users, like not for me. And so I really like it of like, cool, very cool idea. I like it. $10,000. Here's mm -hmm. the bet. The chip is on the table. I'm never going to bug you guys. I'm never going to bother you. I'm only going to like talk about you positively. Um, and you never know when a founder who presents horribly is end going to end up having an amazing outcome because yeah. Oftentimes you have a broad spectrum of people that have very different talents and personalities. And so you don't want to miss. So that's why it's almost like, I almost don't want to meet the founder in some instances mm -hmm. where it's like, that's going to skew my perception one way or another. I almost want to treat every investment on a, mm -hmm. is it a solving an inevitable problem that everyone's going to love and use at some point? Um, and I like that because those I'm looking for really outsized returns so I don't get too excited about the typical SaaS type of businesses that are very common and print a lot of money for like a standard venture capitalist, uh, because those are very much like, hey, here's an enterprise problem. We know it needs to be solved. And uh, so we think that with this amount of money and with this amount of sales and stuff, we're going to be able to create a SaaS business that does X, Y, Z. And it's like, there's a little bit of like, um, to me, I feel like that's more of going to be a five to 10 X return potentially, uh, on, on average, or maybe like a lot of zeros out because you couldn't end up getting product market fit in, uh, in the B to, uh, B2C type play versus ideas that are like everyone on the planet will use this if they're right, or like mm -hmm. every company will, or, and I like those and I like to fund those more often than not. And I like to be able to miss a bunch and just be like, Hey, I did a hundred thousand dollars in bets here. I lost $90,000, but one of them ended up being a company that had a $30 million valuation is now worth $7 billion. And it's like the return on that is so outsized. And I didn't go through all this mental anguish of like debating and thinking about it. And then like, being concerned and then being too invested to like bug the founder. It's like one of the big pieces of advice that I got when I was raising money for my company was never take money from someone who's um, high enough net worth to invest in you, but not high enough net worth to never think about you ever again. Because then you've got people who are putting money in and it matters to them. Uh, and like that you have to, as a founder, perform for them, then they start getting into the weeds of your business of like, oh, mm -hmm. I gave that, I gave that kid a hundred thousand dollars. Like that was hard earned money from my practice, my law practice or my dental practice. And like, I've got to now do phone calls and follow up and how's the company doing. And it's like, that's an, that's an antagonistic relationship. That's going to distract people at the end of the day. And it's like, it's just much better to not take that much money. I will tell you uh, an, interesting, an interesting story, and uh, it's about the last round of uh, money that I raised with my partner, Garrett. So Garrett and I started uh, Scan with uh, our third partner, Ben, and we went out and we raised several million dollars from, you know, up to 10 million bucks from VCs and uh, just the traditional institutions. Yeah. And uh, after I retired, Garrett asked me to come help him build a cartoon studio. And uh, the cartoon studio uh, was, he'd, he'd built a massive online following and it, he, we'd already got an offer for $10 million from HBO to be able to license the cartoon idea that he had. And I was like, that's just like really interesting. And I think it'll be fun to make a family friendly cartoon. And like, there was, there's some other like uh, examples in the market of like um, uh, shows done by influencers that have like done really well uh, or like had outsized returns. And one of the things that we did is there was a new tool called Republic and Republic mm -hmm. allowed anyone who was a non-accredited investor to invest into uh, 
uh, a private company. And that was due to an updated SEC ruling that happened just recently within the last couple of years, few years. And so Garrett went out and he put on his Instagram, he has 4 million followers. He said, it, would anyone invest in this? And if they did want to, how much money would you want to put in? And that was just a Google form that I designed. And mm -hmm. within a day, we had over $50 million in capital wow. that wanted to come into the company. So then I was like, this is really not the type of money that you want to take when you're starting a business. You do mm -hmm. not want to take big checks from random people on the internet, even if they're dedicated and like amazing followers. And so uh, we debated this for a long time and we basically landed on, we're going to raise 3 million from that public fundraising route. And we're going to let people put in a maximum of $100. Hmm. And, that, and that was very specific. So we raised $3 million from 30,000 investors. Wow. wow. And the reason why that was important to me is this principle of if someone feels like they are uh, upset about how the company's moving or they want input, we can just send them a hundred dollars and just like, let, let them have mm -hmm. their equity. Gotcha. Just be like, Hey, we're sorry, this isn't working out. Or like, we're sorry that you're not happy with our progress and we want to make you whole. But that gets a little bit weird if they put $25,000 in, you follow me? And so I think taking money from massive institutional funds that have uh, 50, 100, 500 million in, uh, in their fund that they need to deploy is a lot better for a founder because you're going to get someone who's not going to be so concerned. And, and I think that VCs uh, um, and angels can mess things up mm -hmm. by having having meetings with founders and being like, the whole direction has to be this way. And you took my money and therefore you should do what I say. And it's like, I don't know, I'm not in the weeds on your business. Maybe there's a bunch of edge cases that I'm not thinking about. And the reason why I funded you is because I have to implicitly trust you that you're going to do your very best. And to think that I'm going to have to like work to have meetings with you, to constantly advise you about what you should be doing or not doing. That's actually the wrong business. Like, reviewing I've, I've probably so we've raised money from what 30,000 uh individual investors like like uh that are non-institutional but then i've raised money from maybe like 25 institutional partners uh at, at bigger check values of like over 100k to five million dollars uh in a single check coming in and the best ones the best vcs are the ones who just make introductions for you and they don't hassle you or haggle you my favorite story was when uh so we sold our company uh to snapchat and um i remember emailing uh menlo ventures uh to let them know the news and there was just a kind of a sense of like oh that's amazing like we almost forgot that we had invested in you <laughs> like that's incredible <laughs> like uh, very nice work you guys like that's great high five like, <laughs> yeah, like, like we'll send you over our information to be able to make the distribution payment and I love that relationship of like the partner there bet on us. Uh, uh, he bet on the idea. Who was the partner there? Uh, the partner there was uh, initially uh, one of my favorite people ever, Shervin Pishavar, hmm. uh, who's gone on to fund and create a bunch of uh, really great companies. And then yeah. uh, Sean, and then Sean Carolyn took over, and he was okay, the one. Okay, cool. Yeah, I know Sean. Yeah, I love him. And when I emailed him, he was like, "Oh, Shervin did this deal. Great!" Like. So, <laughs> That's another thing that you have to anticipate is that partners at VC firms will change. And yeah. like, that's why I like uh, taking money that is just bullish on the entrepreneur, but not nagging and yeah. not, uh, and not annoying, which is why I myself as a VC don't want to be nagging and annoying. I just want to be able to make introductions and I don't want to have so much skin in the game that I'm stressing out. Yeah. I've also found that my high conviction bets are where I've lost the most money. And, and like, this is like, uh, maybe there's some game theory internally in it, but it's like when a founder has talked to me and maybe it goes back to what Naval was saying and they've sold themselves to me and like, they're, they're so big and they're going to be so good. And then it builds my conviction up. And then I drop like a hundred grand in that's the one where it's like a year later, the company goes out of business and it's like, yeah. ah, I shouldn't have, uh, let myself get so close to the founder and to the deal to become persuaded um so aggressively like it's better to just be like uh here's 10 grand or here's 25k and let's just let's yeah. not get not not get too in bed together um so kirk just i mean these stories are awesome 
Uh, but, you know, circling back on a, just a few points you had here, I think one I hear is like diversification, right? Writing check sizes you, you're willing to lose and doing a bunch of bets, right? And I think that's just time and time and again in all investing, right? Spread your eggs, not all, all eggs in one basket. Um, and so that, you know, it's probably personal check size and just how much your budget is, but spreading them out. Um, I'm hearing a really interesting like theme for you is like you have like, maybe you try to remove uh, a bias or potential investing weakness of where you get to know the founder and you get emotionally invested in it. Um, and so that's an interesting where you, you try to like remove that element so you can make a more clinical decision, um, which I, I find also to be a really interesting point for many people because, you know, most people, their deal flow is their network, right? And therefore it's like, I like these people and I want to invest. And I go, I think it goes against a little bit of a conventional wisdom where, um, you're saying like, you know, people say like, you know, invest in the founder, right? And because the idea might not work, right? Or whatever they pivot and things like that. And I think it's a, just an interesting angle. Um, at so, scale, it's, yeah. it's, at scale, it's hard to know all the founders. I mm -hmm. think that's the problem is like, once you have hundreds of investments, like having an intimate relationship yeah. with the founders is like really difficult. And plus there's a lot of founders that you're just not gonna have access to just because how many people can people know in their lives? And like, I'll get, you know, I'll invest in a portfolio company for my own stuff. And like every once in a while, I'll have a founder reach out and say, can we do a 30 minute meeting? And I love that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't need a 30 minute meeting to decide to invest. I just need to read the idea and see the pitch. And then it's like, oh yeah, I like that. Or I don't like that. So what's the fastest you've ever committed to a deal? Oh, it's just like 10 seconds. It's like, <laughs> Okay, I'll tell you the last. The last oh, and then bit. how fast did you wire? <laughs> uh, well, it's crazy, like because it's Angelus, but like yeah. I got an email and it was uh, it was for a new stealth company that's building a humanoid robot to compete with Tesla's humanoid robot, and I'm like valuation is low. They had all like the they had all the roster of people that was like MIT robotics blah 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 blah. I'm like guaranteed in the next fifty years we're gonna have robots in the houses doing stuff. Mm -hmm. for, okay, go. Let's just get the company updates. Let's see what happens. It was. 15 second decision, next, 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 submit, done. And it's like humanoid robots are going to happen. And when they happen, it's going to be a complete paradigm shift for everything. If you've got a humanoid robot mowing your lawn or building something in the backyard or making you breakfast or folding your laundry, that's game over. And we yeah. all want that. Uh, so, and so, so yeah, I can make decisions like really fast and then I'm not afraid. And I'm never going to meet the founder because they're not going to be accessible to me. So I want to circle back to uh, your... IRR, which is obviously great and uh, I think highly coveted uh, by you. So let's talk about like the portfolio and what's driving that. I I'm intrigued, um, you know, from your perspective, like how many companies are driving that? Is there a certain type of company? Uh, just, can you give us a flavor of what, you know, what's driving the returns? Yeah, I think the, um, I think the biggest returns are from the kind of like vintage companies that are at least five years old where they've gone. And to me, this is like my favorite thing when you've invested in a company at the sub $30 million valuation. And now they're like, not just unicorn, but they're like five to $10 billion valuation. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can't name the specifics of some of these just because of the confidentiality that I yeah. agreed to when I invested. But one example is I invested $2,000 $2, in a startup when I was poor yeah. and I was first on AngelList. <laughs> And that company, I've invested at a $5 million valuation. And I think they just raised a recent round at $11 billion. Wow. And so that 2 million, I still haven't done the math on that, but that 2000 is now worth over 2 million. Um, and so it's like, I love that because that is now ammo for me to go invest in and do that. Now, instead of doing little $2,000 checks, I can do 25 K checks out of those, out of those returns and roll it forward. And so I think that that's like one of the things that angel investing you have to be prepared for is that this is going to be a very long time horizon. I have uh, yeah. one of my closest friends who I said, you have to take care of my trust when I die. He's like, screw you. In order to <laughs> unwind this, be like 30 years of like unwinding all of these angel investments. And I'm like, my tax returns, 300 pages of K1s. It's like super <laughs> annoying. But I love it when I'm able to be like, I got into a company like eight years ago and uh, when they were just starting out right out of college and they've gone and made something incredible. And I love that. And I think that um, 
the number of companies that are eligible to be multi-billion dollar companies is a very tiny band, which is why I like spray and pray uh, aggressively um, just because, and I think that is a function of how many deals I'm able to see. And if you want deal flow uh, just to start out and to start get access, like to get access, I think AngelList is a fantastic place just to start. Now there's a few things that I've learned that are now red flags to me uh, in all of my time. And one of the things, yeah, one of the things that I've learned that is like probably bad vibes is anytime you see a C plus deal or a series A plus deal. And anytime I see that, I'm like, no, 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 I don't like that typically means that the startup has ran out of capital. Uh, They Mm -hmm. weren't able to get product market fit. And now they're looking for some type of bridge round to try a pivot. And it's like uh, the foundational idea didn't work. And now you're betting on the team. And uh, and I that's not wrong. But for the investment profile that I'm looking for, yeah. I'm like, if I already got into the seed deal and you're doing a seed plus now, I'm not the bridge round guy. Mm-hmm. That just doesn't fit my thesis. So, so anything with a anything with a plus is a red flag. Um, with well, a plus is a red flag. <laughs> I, I like what you said though around kind of um, the time horizon. I mean, what expectations do you think new angel investors should have? Maybe like how much money, like in kind of a realistic but ideal scenario, like how much money should people be coming into angel investing with? I like that you said divide it by a hundred. Um, what about the time horizon and then finding deals? You mentioned angel list. So like if you had to give like three quick pieces of advice on the, on those items, what would you say? That's hard. You typically can't get into most deals unless you're part of a syndicate for less mm-hmm. than a hundred grand. And so you kind of have to go the syndicate route. So let's say that you're like, let's say that you want exposure to VC, yep. uh, but you don't want, uh, but you don't have that much capital, but you are an accredited investor. Mm-hmm. Um, then I think the best exposure to VC is going to be through angel lists, uh, Y combinator funds, uh, or their, uh, and basically what they do is they aggregate hundreds of startups into, Mm -hmm. uh, they have a team that vets them. And then when you, and then you can deploy 25 grand and it'll hit like startups that's going to dilute your return. Right. Because now you've got, now your, your return on that's going to be less, not like 50% because you're not getting direct exposure. Uh, but you're also don't have to make, a hundred individual investments. Mm -hmm. So for someone who just wants exposure to the venture capital asset class that has a potential higher return than S and P 500, I think the angel lists, uh, like, uh, funds are a wonderful product and I've invested in, they have an enterprise fund that does enterprise stuff. They have like uh, international fund. They have a bunch of different funds there that you can go put money into. Then that's something that you really couldn't get like Outside and that could potentially be sort of a one-time investment. You may not see the returns for seven, 10 years, but like time horizon wise, it's like, Hey, you've got some money. You want to get exposure. You put it in, I guess, for the other bucket of people, like, do you, I'm sure you get a lot of people coming to you asking about angel investing. So do you tell them like, Hey, you should be only inv- considering if you've got $200,000 to spare or 1 million, um, yeah. what, what would you tell them? I think like if you're going to bankroll and you're going to come play, like um, have you guys, have you guys ever played craps in Vegas or just like craps in general? Yeah. So like craps when like having a good time in Vegas with craps is a function of your bankroll Mm -hmm. and, and, and the minimum bet size. And so I think the analogy like plays over perfectly into angel. Let's say that you want to go play at a table and, uh, and you're going to play craps and you've got a hundred dollars and the minimum bet is like 15 bucks. It's like, you're going to be there for 10 minutes. You're going to zero out. And then you have to walk away uh, because the odds there um, are the odds of losing are too high and your bankroll is not long enough or big enough to be able to let you lose multiple times and mm-hmm. be able to play the doubling down and, and making your money back. And so if you want to be able to have like a three hour party at the craps table and have a great time and you're laughing yeah. and cheering and celebrating people, if the minimum bets $15, and you want to be able to stack up to like $60 on backing that bet and doing yeah. it and like down and all of that, you probably want to have a grand yeah. that you're playing with. And then what's nice about having a grand is as long as you're playing at the 50, 50 odds, you're most likely going to walk away with a thousand dollars and you had a yeah. great time and you just won and you just played the 50, 50. But if you start out with 300 bucks and you get zeroed out too early, well, then you have to walk away from the table and you have no chance to be able to win on any of the big wins. Yeah. So let's say that, 
the on angel list you can get small you can get like two thousand mm-hmm. dollars in a in a bet. so it's like all right let's see how many how many investments do i need to make to have two thousand dollars be meaningful let's say that it's 50 to 100 so you mm-hmm. probably want to have at least 100 to 200 grand available to place bets uh, on being a syndicate backer i would say where you're just backing a syndicate that's uh, like sourcing the deals for you. And you're just, and cause that's the only way you'll be able to drop two right. grand in it anyways. Right. So I would say like, you probably want to have a hundred to 200 K and you want to probably try to get into 150 to hundred companies. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to do very tiny checks and just spread it out. What's really cool about that is you're going to get uh, periodic investor updates and mm-hmm. you're going to just get a massive education about what's working and what's not working. One of my favorite emails that I get, is a founder email when they're shutting the company down. And uh, I know that's a little bit messed up to say, but it's like, (laughs) because my risk is typically low. I'm like, this is the, this is like the pinnacle of anguish in this person's life. And they have probably gone many sleepless nights, stressed out of their mind. And it's all going to culminate in this one email to the investors to say, I lost your money. And those, that's very interesting to me because what did you learn? <clears throat> One of my favorite ones was from a company called Magic. And Magic was an early San Francisco startup that I backed. And it was something that I thought should have been an inevitability, which was I should be able to Uber a house cleaner to my home. Yeah. Like, that's super annoying for people to have to manage. It's really annoying to be able to get someone to come clean your house. So the founder emails everyone and he says, we've clo- we're, we're dis- like the company's dissolved. We're returning like we only have like 7% of the money that we have. I personally put 2 million of my own money in and I lost that as well. So it was like, I had skin in the game too. <clears throat> and he was like, what we learned is that as soon as a relationship formed between a house cleaner and a, uh, and a householder, mm-hmm. uh, we were immediately cut out because the specifics of cleaning a house are so nuanced that you can't, it's not like you can get a random Uber driver every single time. Yeah. You're just going from A to B. It's like, here's how I like this cleaned. Here's how this room needs to be done. Here's who I trust coming into my home. And so to create a marketplace for that was actually very difficult without getting cut out of the marketplace entirely. So another company, uh, and like, I thought that was a beautiful like dissolution email. It was like, thank you for telling us why it failed. And now we can use that to pattern match future investments and be like, hey, is someone doing a marketplace type company where the actual work being done is nuanced? Yeah. Then we need to be careful. I just recently backed a laundry company that is a marketplace for laundry. And it was like, that was a little bit iffy. It was like, well, is the nuance of doing someone's laundry like as nuanced as cleaning their house? And it's like you Mm -hmm. set a bag out on your front porch and then it comes back and it I think that it's like, that's actually like a really nice uh, kind of like meet in the middle of like laundry is on the doorstep and then it comes back a day later cleaned. I don't need to know who cleaned it. I don't care about it. It just needs to be clean and folded nicely. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> so I kind of use that moving forward, but. Um, what was that great. company? Yeah. Uh, uh, so there's a couple that I did, uh, but the last one that I did was Dree, which was a local startup. And uh cool. So yeah, their, their name is Dree and uh, I've loved them and I've used them for the last uh, year. And I basically, I went to my wife and I was like, you're never going to do my laundry ever again. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, and she hasn't. And I just, anytime I have laundry, I put it in the Dree bag. And then on Mondays I put it out on the porch and then it comes back on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday and I put weight and it's all folded perfectly. And I put it away. It's like the nice. best 40 bucks a week I can spend. Almost nice. as if it's magic. Uh, <laughs> bunch, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Bad, bad jokes, bad jokes. I'm saving um, that one, Hong Colin. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we jump into Twitter threads, you know, it was funny that you know you're you're saying that like the post mortem is almost like the most interesting. And I was just thinking, like, well, yeah, if you only pay a thousand, two thousand bucks, and you get a post mortem on why a company didn't work, that's like a pretty good investment. Yeah. Like just in and of itself, like what you know, like why doesn't this idea or these things don't work, and you only had to pay a thousand dollars for it. Like if you thought about like an expert in something and paying them for their hourly rate for something, you know, it's probably pretty good. All right. So we're going to jump in and do some hot takes on Twitter and we'll try and do three, but maybe we'll get through two. Um, since we talked a bit about the, uh, the update side of thing, um, let's go to private equity guy. Um, his tweet was, I think it was Harry Stebbings from 20 VC podcast. who said that one of 38 companies he has in it 
uh, out of 38 companies in his portfolio, only eight do monthly updates, only eight. And these eight are the most successful and they have the most disciplined founders. Lessons learned, thanks, Harry Stebbings. This is the um, other Harry, by the way, the the, yes, the, the popular yeah. Harry. The, the famous one, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we've talked about this before on investor updates, um, just being important and something that like you should do. Um, but I think there's a kind of a thread here of like, is this correlation or causation, right? Do do great founders and great companies do updates or do writing the updates cause great companies and great founders? Uh, so what's your take, Kirk? Uh, what do you, how do you think about that? That's such a good question. I just want to say that. That's like, <laughs> I mean, just understanding the nuance of founder updates, I think is like, just for playing the game of VC is like, I love that. Um, sometimes when companies send me too much updates, I think they're screwed. <laughs> I just think like, <laughs> you guys are typing way too much to me. You're not talking to your customer. It goes back to the deck being too good. Yeah. And it's like, you're curating your relationship. It's like the employee when you're a manager, who's just like way too good at managing up. And it's like, you should maybe just do your job instead of like presenting reports to me about how you would like to do your job that look really good and make me excited. And so I don't know, I think monthly is like nice, but it should be more of like in a side of like, Hey, here's how we're doing. And here's like the key things. And does anyone know anyone who can help? Uh, versus like, here's a 10 page or seven page update of each of our things and our financial statements and all of that. And it's like, go talk to your customers, stop talking to us, like go figure out how to get a, a million more customers or 10,000 new signups, like stop talking to us. And, but then to go ghost mode and to get nothing is like, ah, I'm probably yeah. screwed. <laughs> like that. So I would say that I would strike a balance as a founder. And I would say, I'm going to send a really good quarterly update email uh, and I'm going to send ad hoc um, help me emails. Mm. Uh, and, mm. and I also think it's like a really bad sign when someone is sending their cash on hand and their uh, and what their burn is and how many months they have left. That's just like, every time I read that, I'm like, you guys are screwed. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just see that seems to be the pattern of like, if you're reporting your financials to me, uh, on a monthly basis and you're constantly worried about burn, you didn't raise enough money to get to MVP. Hmm. And so now you're like keeping me apprised of how poor you are. And that just makes me more bearish. And so don't tell me how much money you have or don't have. Like, it, like if you're going to manage that relationship with me, just tell me what problems you're facing with getting product market fit and yeah. how I can potentially help. So Kirk, out of the hundreds of companies off the top of your head, no need to you know, do a deep analysis, but do you think yeah. you've seen uh, a correlation here between you know, updates that you're getting from certain founders and success off the top I of your head? I think updates, the company's effed and they're gonna zero out. Okay. Uh, infrequent updates, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna say that maybe. Like it's, maybe that's just like a, a, a cordial thing. Completely so, ghosted is, is actually kind of interesting because it's like you're either having so much success that you don't talk to <laughs> at all or you have nothing to report. So right. I would say the only clear signal I have in that is if a founder is over-reporting their status, they're probably not in a good spot. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Um, well, I, I like I like that feedback. So I think definitely clearly very frequent updates, bad, everything else, a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, yeah. The next tweet we have here for you is from Dennis Hegstad, who apparently is Colin's neighbor, by the way, in Austin, um, random. Yeah, he is. But uh, he says he made, I, I like this question for you too. Um, Kirk, as we talked about some of the returns, he says, I made 39 angel investments over the last three years, and this is where they stand, 2020 to 2023. Zero have returned capital so far. Two have gone to zero dollars. Two have taken greater than 50% reduction evaluations. One is marked up 1,000%. Six wow. have markups of 30 to 200%. 28 have no updates refunding. Um Beautiful. What do you think? He actually followed this up and said, I probably won't be making any more angel investments. I'm going to stick to cash flowing real estate deals. So I don't know. I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say anything, but what do you think about that kind of, um, I, you know, for your bravo. return profile? Good. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah. Like the thing that he Good did job. is he, he brought his money to the, uh, to the craps table. He deployed mm -hmm. his entire bag 
and now we wait 10 years and see what happens but he'll probably uh he'll probably make pretty good money as that portfolio grows. I, I thought he did pretty well that's why it was funny that he said i'm yeah. not going to be doing it anymore i'm gonna stick to real estate because i was like oh it seems like you know one thousand one one thousand percent seems good right my, my advice to him is like uh I, like cash out your cost basis mm -hmm. so that you feel like you did something good at the at the casino and like maybe buy some property with that or get some treasury what you know treasuries or whatever but then if you have like good returns like then keep playing the game and let's let let's let it roll and like let that be a game that we play as long as you're not spending too much time and you know and and like it was as long as the time to allocate yeah. those 39 bets wasn't just a nightmare so let your winners ride yeah uh, you know there's i'd say one thing that i've thought a lot about being someone that's worked in startups like for too long probably at this point is that you know, I didn't do a lot of early angel investing early in my career because I was just thinking about concentration risk. I was like, my salary is all in startups. All of my net worth is in the equity in these startups. Do I really want to be investing more money in more startups, right? Um, and uh, I know, you know Dennis works in tech, so I think, you know, he's building a company. And so I just think there's an interesting like uh, strategy here of like going into something that's a little bit more, you know, stable return, things like that. So just an interesting take from that, that perspective. I do have a really strong opinion on net worth allocation and Let's hear. I, I just have some very simple rules here. You need to have in cash equivalents, um, at least a year and a half of personal burn. So like you should never not like before you start going crazy with investments, mm -hmm. make sure that you be without employment for a year and a half. And let that be the foundation of safety that you have in case crazy crap happens in your family or in your in your health. So, and then once you have that, then you can follow some really basic allocations with the excess of your emergency fund, which is 20% of that should be high risk crap. And that can be 10% uh, of your net worth goes into crypto and 10% goes into angel. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the other stuff, I like, I, I just believe in the in the bread and butter of like, uh, it can be a mixture of municipal bonds, real estate, uh, just equities, uh, you know, keep that allocation, but allow 20% of your net worth after your emergency fund go into things that can provide asymmetric outsized returns and, uh, and then be disciplined in that. Like if you, if you have, let's say that you're, you're spending a hundred grand a year, or let's say 150 grand a year on your family and your personal burn. Uh, and then you have an extra, 300 grand in savings. Don't put all of that in startups. Don't put all of that in crypto. Put 30 grand of that into crypto of your excess 300 and, and maybe put 30 grand of it into an AngelList uh, diversified uh, portfolio. Um, but don't be irresponsible um, with your allocation of money because you're trying to chase these really outsized returns and thinking that you're going to be able to get them. It's a 10 year investment horizon when you're putting into a startup, seven to 10 years, you're not going to see that money back and you have to have allocation principles on how you put it. And so it's very easy for people to, um, you get exuberant in what you're doing and you're like, this is going to be the next big thing. And then that can like cause massive pain. And you're just like, no, nope, I just have my budget. My budget is 20% high risk. And that's what it is of my, of my net worth. And so I think that's how you preserve wealth without completely destroying it, but get exposure to exponential growth as well. Got it. Thanks for that. Um, well, we kind of teased at the beginning that you have uh, been working on some things. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that. Um, AI. Before we let you go. Yeah. <laughs> I just did the funniest hackathon ever with my friends over the weekend. And uh, so we created a website. It's called Random Seed. And random you can go to seed. Random, you can go to randomseed.com. And it's what a good I domain did, name. Yeah. What I did is uh, I've been very obsessed with AI generated art. And uh, uh, I, I basically just took every verse of the Bible and I put it into stable diffusion, which is an uh, image generator. And so if you go to randomseed.com, there's a button called read Genesis chapter one. And when you click on that, it's, you can start to read every verse of the Bible with an illustration per verse and see how AI interpreted the Bible. This and cool. uh, yeah. And so we posted it on Reddit yesterday. We got 18,000 visits yesterday, just the day that we posted it and uh, about 40,000 page views. 
And I think that uh, I want to do the works of Shakespeare. I want to do any public domain work and have it illustrated. Yeah. And uh, I just think that it's, uh, I, to me, I always want to be on top of whatever the newest technologies are and what they're coming out. And what this is one of the things that I did in school is like, if I'm interested in a topic and I think that it's a game changer, let's do a little project to learn more about it and understand mm -hmm. what it can do and what it cannot do. And AI based image generation and text generation is going to completely change the entire landscape over the next 10 years. And I think that content and how it's produced and how it's created is going to be very interesting. And so uh, I, and I, and so I'm just very excited about AI and I was like, let's just do a little project. And uh, people have been going through and reading the Bible uh, illustrated and yeah. I had to build moderation tools because these AI models <laughs> crazy stuff Go a little crazy yeah, might so offend a few like, people <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like like as an engineer you always just got to kind of be on your toes and understand yeah. like what you can do and doing like little fun side projects is a great way to learn um and also create an artifact that can be shared online with other people yeah. and so i don't know where i'm going to take it i have enough traffic where it's interesting that i should probably do something with it yeah. uh, but yeah, the images just, are really cool. I'm looking at them right now and there's definitely a lot of sun and regal looking light. Um, but I mean, you know, they look like pretty high quality images for each one and, and they're it, very relevant too. It makes us as investors have to ask this question. Yeah. And it's a very hard question to answer because the future is so opaque. Like we have no idea where this is going. But the one thing that it makes you have to realize is like, the ability to get a high quality illustration for basically free. Yeah. What, what impact is that going to have on the entire creative landscape? What does that mean? And so I'm, I'm just keeping my eyes peeled for companies that are going to be leveraging AI for content production and leveraging it in a way that is good. This, my website that I just threw up here is just like, really like I put it up over a weekend and I was mm -hmm. just generating like way too much content but i think that it's going to get very interesting uh we're at the point now where computers are able to demonstrate creativity and that i didn't think was going to come for a very long time but the way that the computers interpret words like they're going to be producing music and uh video and it's going to be really interesting so i'm watching that space but i think it's going to be a space that's going to be easy to mess up and like yeah. think that it could be big and then have it like easily like not hit something yeah. that resonates with with people so well i think kirk you just inspired colin and i and everyone listening to not sit on our asses on the couch this weekend and watch tv <laughs> we might have to actually uh do a couple fun side projects or get a little yeah, work done sure. so sure. really and appreciate harry i should cut you off and just tell you that ai coded most of the site okay so, so you didn't actually no do way. anything <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna i was gonna comment you know you did all this and you allowed for dark you know night mode dark mode um I just, which is great guys, if you're an engineer you need to use github copilot it's freaking crazy yep. cool huh. awesome well we really appreciate you coming on kirk this was great i learned a ton and also super inspiring too um if folks uh want to follow you where, where's a good place so we'll leave a link to randomc.com i think that'll be fun to check it out sounds like you're active on angel list i don't know if people can add you as a friend or follow your deals there but that might be cool uh what do you tell people uh you can just go to my website and then i have links to every social and angel list and all of that and if you put Sweet. that link in there, just my name uh as my domain name and I just wanted to say thank both of you for letting me have the chance to come on and talk and just grateful for the opportunity to hear your insights and, and get to know you as well. Definitely. Thanks, Kirk. All right, guys. We'll see ya.